So we've got this Fed meeting. All of a sudden, we now are trying to comprehend what higher for longer really means. Will that be manifested in the form of dots, or what does it mean for you as you look forward? Well, of course, this week they're not going to hike rates, but whether this is going to be a skip or a pause is to be seen. Skip will be a case in which they don't hike, but then leave it open to hiking maybe in November or later. A pause will be a signal that, no, they are done. I don't think they can say they are done because the economy is still growing above potential. Headline inflation is going higher now that oil prices are going higher, and therefore, potentially, they have to leave the option open that there will be another hike. What is the most misconceived idea? A lot of people have lived through 5% rates before. You have, I have. I've lived through 15% rates, so have you. Is the greatest disconnect in markets that we are pricing 100 basis points of cuts next year when the reality is inflation is malingering, core CPI is still tight and hot. What's the greatest misconception about inflation? Uh, you're absolutely right. I think that the markets are still thinking the inflation is going to drop towards 2% and therefore the Fed is going to cut rate and cut them aggressively. The Fed is pushing back at things than you. They're saying we're going to be essentially higher for longer, not just the Fed, but other central banks. There are structural forces that imply that inflation may be higher, from deliberalization to aging to geopolitics to other negative supply shocks. And therefore, I think markets are still a little bit uh, too optimistic that the Fed is going to aggressively cut rates starting early next year. That's not going to be the case. At the earliest, Marielle. the Fed is going to start cutting rates maybe towards the middle of the year. Yes. Danny, Danny here in London. Great to speak with you, Noriel. On that point, look, it's a world saddled with $300 trillion worth of debt. If the Fed isn't going to cut as soon as expected, what happens when we hit that maturity wall come next year? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we live in a world in which there is too much private and public debt. In addition to the official public debt, there is also implicit liability coming from unfunded social security and health care liability coming with aging. And I think that one of the threats, of course, is not just the trade-off that central banks are facing between growth and inflation, but it's actually a trilemma. They have to worry about financial stability. And the more you raise interest rates, and the more they go higher on the short end and the long end of the yield curve, the more there are risk of financial instability. You saw it in what happened in the United Kingdom about a year ago. You saw what happened in the spring of this year with the stresses in the financial system. I don't think we are out of the woods. As rates have to stay higher for longer, the possibility mm. of some degree of financial instability is still with us. Well, I was going to say, to, to start the year, there had been a lot of fear-mongering that QT would perhaps cause that financial instability. But it's, it's gone off with minimal issues, Noriel. Can, can the Fed continue on its progress of QT, or will something make them stop? Well, for the time being, of course, QT has not had a huge impact. Even if uh, long rates have gone higher, they've gone higher in part because growth has been stronger than expected, but that could be also implicitly the effect of having a quantitative tightening occurring. The fact that other central banks like the BOJ will have to phase out their easy monetary policy can put higher pressure on long-term interest rates as well. If inflation stays higher, for longer, that's going to also put upper pressure on short and long end of the yield curve. And the higher long rates are, the more the potential for some degree of financial stresses in the system. One of the mega threats that comes in at number five on your chart list is stagflation. Yeah. By any measure, Europe is already there. So my question to you is this. I mean, they can't even call the top of rates. Lagarde did and Kazakhs didn't over the weekend. How brutal a form of stagflation are we looking at in Europe, given history? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, in the US right now, <clears throat> growth is still positive and about potential. In the Eurozone, has been either negative or close to zero for the last three quarters. And the latest signals coming from Germany and the rest of the Eurozone suggest that the economy is going to be stagnating. At the same time, inflation is still way above uh, target, not just in the Eurozone, but the other case of stagflation, of course, is the United Kingdom, where right now inflation is even higher than the Eurozone and economic activity is slowing down very sharply. So what uh, uh, Europe is facing is a situation which on one side economic activity is contracting, on the other side is inflation is too high. That's what the stagflationary scenario it is. And that's a dilemma for both the ECB 
and the Bank of England. On one side, the contracting economic activity will lead them to maybe stop at this point. On the other side, if inflation remains much higher than the target, yeah. they may have to hike much more. That's a big dilemma, especially for the Bank of England. Hey, hey, Rubini, but before we get to break, I, I do want to bring up one point. Last year, you predicted a, a long and ugly recession for the U.S. That would start last year, continue for this year. We haven't seen that yet. Did you get something wrong there? Is it recession denied or delayed? Well, you know, most uh, forecasters, including even the staff of the Fed, were expecting a recession. The good news is that it doesn't look like we're going to have a real hard landing. Then the question is whether we're going to have a soft landing or a bumpy landing bumpy landing being a, maybe a short and shallow recession. And on that debate, we don't know yet. There are longer and variable lags of monetary policy. The Fed might have to hike more. Uh, the credit issues that might emerge as there is tightening of financial condition. Oil prices higher imply on one side higher inflation and lower economic activity, even in the United States. So I would say that whether we're going to have a true soft landing, rather a short and shallow recession, is still as an open question, even for the United States. Nouriel, I'm trying to get the most underpriced risk out of you. From the tone of what you just said, the UK could be there. Confidence in the Bank of England is at a record low by their own survey. It's never been as low. How much are we underpricing what more Bailey and the Bank of England needs to do? How much more of a brutal stagflation scenario is it for the UK? Wrap it up. Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The problem is that the Bank of England right now is sending sort of dovish signal in a situation in which the policy rates are well above the Fed, but inflation is well above the United States. So what they should be doing is actually hiking rates all the way to at least 575. The signals are telling us right now is they're not sure whether they want even to hike more. If that happens, there could be a de-anchoring of inflation expectation. You could have a true stagflation. Okay, uh, the stagflation calls uh, from Nouriel Rabini comes in at number five on his charts. Nouriel, Hollywood's on strike, the auto workers are on strike, Europe has its form of angst. Is again going back to the underpriced risks, the, the, the tail risks, as it were, from mega threats over the next couple of years for central banks? It's about wages. This is another example of where second round effects are perhaps underpriced. Uh, they're absolutely so. I mean, there's been a significant increase in income and wealth inequality. The share of labor in income has fallen. The share of capital has gone up. And now that unemployment rate is much lower in the United States, but also in Europe, the workers have pricing power. And fiscal policies also during the COVID recession became pro-union, pro-workers, pro-wages, pro those who are left behind. So I think we're going to see a meaningful amount of labor strife because uh, inequality has been rising and now labor has more power than the past. And that's going to be a source of wage inflation that's going to keep the unit labor cost rising more than otherwise. And that implies that most likely inflation is going to be higher than 2%. Now, look, AI is again on your mega threats. AI and job disruption, it, job disruption, it comes in at number eight. What went through my mind when I was preparing to sit down and talk to you was about universal income. How quickly will that begin to be much more of a conscious conversation as AI accelerates? Or is, is there a considerable lag between AI innovation, NVIDIA booming, and the chip stocks booming, and universal income, real job destruction? Well, the real job disruption is going to occur over time. There will be a significant amount of permanent technological employment, not just among uh, blue collars because of robotic automation, but especially among cognitive workers that are white collar. And then there will be a reaction on what to do about it. The problem with universal basic income is a good idea, but if today you had to give, say, $1,000 to every American per month, only $12,000 a year, that's not much money, it would cost us today with the current GDP growth about 20% of GDP, so we cannot afford it. Of course, if over time AI leads to much higher productivity growth and much higher potential growth, we eventually will be able to afford UBI. But from a fiscal point of view, UBI currently is mission impossible. So there's a lot of talk about it, but it's going to take a significant amount of time until we see significant amounts of permanent technological employment until that idea becomes politically and economically viable. 
Noriella, in the meantime, in a world where labor has negotiating power for higher wages, what does it say about specifically the American project of home shoring? Is it possible if we're in a world where labor in the U.S. is all of a sudden more expensive? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, even if there was, uh, unquote, uh, reshoring or home shoring, the new factories are going to be capital intensive, skill bias and labor savings. So we're going to have factories with lots of robots and machines, but not that many workers. I think that the benefits are going to go more to some of the emerging markets where the French shoring is going to occur. Some of their friends are allies in Asia, Mexico and other parts of the world because in those countries the cost of labor is lower and therefore any type of reshoring or French shoring is going to be labor intensive as opposed to being capital intensive. But the impact, of course, of reshoring on the U.S. Uh, job market is going to be only very modest. No, okay, really? so then feed, sir, Manus, go ahead. You take it from here. No, no, jump in. Well, I wanted to know, Noriel, about that 2% inflation call. You said we're going to be above there because of these labor, prolonged labor, labor strikes and then the pressure of the nearshoring. How long and how far above 2% do we stay? Is this a fundamental regime shift of inflation in what you're describing? Yes, um, I've argued uh, that uh, the era of the great moderation of low inflation below 2% and stable growth is gone and we're entering an area of what I call great stagflationary and financial instability. Higher inflation is going to be caused both by supply side factors, deglobalization, geopolitical conflict, aging of population, restriction of migration, reshoring, global climate change, pandemics, cyber warfare, backlash against inequality, partial deglobalization. Those are all supply side factors that reduce growth and increase the cost of production. And on the demand side, we live in a world in which there is so much private and public debt and deficits are going to remain higher because we'll have to spend more against inequality, against climate change, to deal with pandemic, to deal with inequality coming from globalization and AI, and so on and so on. So spending will be higher. Taxes are not going to rise as much. Structural deficits will be higher. So either we crowd our growth or have debt crisis, or eventually we have to monetize it, and that's going to cause essential inflation. So both on the supply side and the demand side, there are factors imply that 2% is at this point mission impossible, and the new normal may be somewhere between 3 and 4% for advanced economies, over time, of course, not overnight. So there are structural factors rather than cyclical that imply that inflation is going to be much higher for the longer term. The last time you were on... Bloomberg TV, you talked about a 10% decline in equities. We're going to switch up the pace. Fast answer, rapid fire here. I want to get to that call. Tell me where you land on stocks at this moment. Would you want to be shorting or going long American stocks? Uh, for the rest of the year, I will be shorting U.S. stocks. All right. And is that a 10% decline? Is that still about where you think we could land? Uh, it's, it's highly possible, given what's happening in the U.S. and the global economy and rising oil prices and inflation being still sticky and the Fed and other central banks not being done yet. All right, is that a call just for American stocks, Noriel, or globally, are you looking dour on equities? Well, in the rest of the world, it's even worse than the United States. In the U.S., you might have a bumpy landing, but in the Eurozone and the U.K., we're talking about inflation and recession, stagflation. China is slowing down sharply. so. The rest of the world is even worse than the United States, I would say, in relative terms. I'm going to get a bullish call out of you. When do we hit $100 in oil, will we? Uh, I don't know if that's bullish. Might be bullish for the oil market. It's not bullish, bullish, bullish for inflation. It's not bullish for growth. It'll be pretty bad. It's another stagflationary shock. You know, When oil prices go higher because there is stronger demand, that's consistent with economic activity being stronger. But if it's a negative supply shock because Saudi and others are cutting supply, that causes a greater inflation, lower growth throughout the world. So that's actually bad for the global economy. Where do you see oil going to, Nouriel? Where's the upside on it? Well, it depends. You know, it depends on what happens on the supply side. If the OPEC plus keeps on restricting supply, oil prices can go higher. But I would say that if global demand is going to soften because you have Europe in a recession, China slowing down, even the U.S. are going to slow down, eventually probably there will be some correction to these oil prices on the demand side. 
Noriel, I'm going to try again for a bullish call. I know Manus was trying to do it. It's our first show. we got to be positive about something, Noriel. Yeah. Take me to the FX world. What currency pair would you want to be long right now? Well, for the time being, I would say uh, the dollar, because in relative growth terms, the U.S. is going to do better than Europe and the rest of the world. But I would say that because of that growth differential and because inflation might be falling in the U.S., probably the Fed might be the first central bank to eventually fully pause and then start cutting rates. And that's going to imply that, say, by next year, the dollar might weaken because of the relative interest rate differential expectation between the United States, Europe, and what's going to happen in Japan, where they have to phase out the YCC and normalize policy rates. So in the short run, is a bullish dollar call. But over the medium term, actually, the factors that are going to lead to a weakening of the U.S. dollar. And, and, and then in that longer term, too, then, is it a long yen call? What do you need to see also from the BOJ to get to that place? Well, I would say that by the end of the year, they might fully phase out the yield curve control. They are already talking also about phasing out the negative interest rate policies. Because the only advanced economies right now are still negative policy rates. And as gradually short rates go higher, long rates go higher, that should be strengthening the yen that has been quite weak, of course, because of the differential in monetary policy between the BOJ and the rest of the advanced economies. Let's just pivot briefly to the, to the Chinese market. Some people are saying we've hit peak pessimism on China from an economic point of view. That's got a consequence for the yuan, yuan your call on China and yuan. Well, the problems <clears throat> of China are not cyclical. They're more structural. Potential growth used to be 10 percent, then down to 5. Today probably is no better than between 3 to 4 percent because you have massive aging of population. You have huge amounts of private and public debt. You have a overhang of real estate. You have a state capitalism galore under Xi Jinping. The sentiment of the private sector households and the private corporate sector is really foul because of the policies of China. You have geopolitics going to restrict both inflows of FDI and exports by China. And they're doing everything wrong in terms of policy. So I would say they'll be lucky if they have 4% growth over the medium term. 3% is more likely. Therefore, the issue of China is not just cyclically that the economy is weak, but structurally is weak. We're going to spend tomorrow on private equity and credit and debt. So let's get your call in terms of do you want to be longer of bonds and duration relative to debt and credit, let's say. Well, I would say that um, high yield spreads are too low in a world in which there's going to be a slowdown of growth, a bumpy landing, stagflation. Eventually, credit risk is going to rise given amounts of private and public debt. So spreads are so low that they can widen from current levels. And on bonds, I would say right now people expect uh, central banks to cut rate aggressively. I don't think that's going to happen. Inflation may surprise on this upside, both in the short term and long term. And there are structural reasons why the risk premia for bonds should be higher, high levels of private and public debt. So I think markets are, again, too optimistic on credit and also on bond markets. Fascinating to see who's not there. I mean, the real power apart from the United States of America, the UK is not there, she's not there, Putin's not there, uh, Modi is not there. How disemboweled is multilateralism or is that a misconception? No, we live in a world in which because of the geopolitical divide between on one side China and other revisionist powers like Russia, Iran or Korea, and on the other side the US and the West, we have a world in which there is a geopolitical depression that's leading to a fragmentation of the global economy de-risking, if not decoupling. There is protectionism. There are going to be restrictions to trade in goods, in services, in the movement of capital, labor, data, information, technology. And that's going to be also stagflationary. We're going to have just in case rather than just in time. Global supply chains, emphasis on security rather than economic efficiency, reshoring and friendshoring rather than offshoring. All these things tend to reduce potential growth, increase the cost of production, and there are stagflationary forces. We're going to have balkanization of global supply chains. So it's a very different world where geopolitics has economic and financial consequences. We already have war waged by Russia on Ukraine. I want to bring you a Bloomberg opinion piece which talks about the coalescing of Putin and Kim Jong-un. And this is what they had to say. Uh, this is about North Korea is a dangerous thing. The idea of a nuclear conflict between the countries that are united against the US and its allies isn't some distant possibility. It's a more real and plausible scenario seen in decades. Of course, we've just seen 
uh, Kim Jong-un and Putin meet over the past couple of days. I'm not asking you to call nuclear war. What I am asking you is about how much more disruptive our geopolitical landscape is with Taiwan, with China, with the U.S., with this coalescing uh, of powers against the U.S. Well, the geopolitical depression is going to get worse. As you pointed out, there is already a hot war with the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine. This war is going to continue, could get uglier, could eventually, potentially even involve NATO, could become non-conventional. The Cold War between U.S. and China is becoming colder, and now people are saying it's only a matter of when or the other weather. There's going to be eventually a conflict on the issue of Taiwan. Iran has reached the point in which they are enriching uranium, and they may decide to go and build a bomb. That's going to be essentially a red flag for Israel. There could be an attack against Iran. And the little dictator in Pyongyang keeps on sending rockets on the sea of Japan and South Korea, and that's also a source of tension. So all these revisionist powers, either they're nuclear powers, or like in the case of Iran, they become nuclear, and therefore these tensions are going to imply at least economic fragmentation, and eventually it could be even more dangerous scenarios. Noriel, I, I want to be clear. Are all those things you laid out inevitable, or is there any mm. hope, again, for any of the <clears throat> risks that you just laid out, that it can be avoided? Well, in my book about mega threats, I talk about these threats and also the solution for each and one of them. But the solution always imply cost and short-run sacrifices for the common good domestically and globally over the medium and long term. And whether you are in a democracy where, because of election, we tend to essentially kick the can down the road, but even in essentially authoritarian regimes, look what's happening in China, where you have essentially policies that are wrong because even autocrats are not able to do the right thing. We live in a world in which there is lack of global leadership at the national and the global level, and therefore these festering problems that are mega threats probably going to get worse rather than getting better. We need actually more governance at the global level because all these problems are global. Climate change, mm -hmm. pandemic, financial economic stability, mm. trade liberalization, and even global security, but in a world of geopolitical division, the ability and willingness to cooperate on these things is less than the past, and therefore that geopolitical fragmentation and economic and financial consequences become over time more severe and more difficult. So we need cooperation, but we're not going to have global cooperation, unfortunately. I want to take one of your other mega threats, Noriel, AI, and apply it to this too. We're about to enter an election cycle for many nations, for America, likely where I am here in the UK too. Have we fully grasped what AI and the age of misinformation will do, the impact it will have in this election cycle? That's one of the very serious risks of uh, AI. It's going to be much more easy to do deep fake, misinformation, disinformation. That was already quite easy in 2016 and 2020, but in 2024, it's going to become much worse. And the enemies of the United States or the rivals, whether it's Russia, North Korea, China, Iran, are going to use these tools and other ones as a way of spreading, actually, doubt and so divisions in a world where already the United States is very partisan. They're going to try to create more partisanship because from a military point of view, they cannot challenge the U.S. yet with the strongest military power. So they have to use asymmetric warfare that implies cyber warfare as a way of dividing U.S. and fragmenting us in a way that's going to be weakening the United States and the ability of the U.S. to project power around the world. No, so it's a huge risk for next year. Okay, Nouriel, thank you very much. Uplifting thought to end, the, to end the, 50, the, fi, the 50 minute conversation, but well done. I think we almost got a smile out of Nouriel there this morning. Uh, Nouriel, thank you very much. Great, great to have you with us you. on our Pleasure. inaugural show. Your contribution, as always, uh, great to have.